Today we're going to dig into the hardware design of the Altair disc system like the one you see here. Now MITS announced the Altair floppy disk back in an April 1975 price list and there it showed a 60 day lead time. So June, July of 75, you might have expected to be able to get one of these. They also announced their operating system port Altair DOS would be available at the same time. But in true MITS fashion, that wasn't even close. It was over a year until they began shipping these. It was um, early May of 1976. They began shipping this disk drive along with Altair Disk Basic. And at that point, there was still no operating system to be found. It was truly just a standalone basic environment. Um, Altair DOS was yet another year and a month or two after that. It was August of 77 until they actually started shipping their disk operating system for the disk drive. Now, getting this shipping in uh, May of 1976, Altair again was really the first one in the marketplace, this time with the disk drive. Now, it wasn't long until MSI and Northstar and some others started popping up. They only had a few months ahead of these other competitors, and they had operating systems, whereas Altair didn't. So by the time Altair DOS was shipping over a year later, uh, MITS was actually behind the curve at that point. Now, interestingly, the Altair computer uh, coming out first, the Altair bus, became a de facto standard that everybody built on. And of course, eventually, the S100 bus was standardized with an IEEE spec. But the disk drive, the interface they chose for that, even though they were first, did not become a standard, not at all. In fact, the standard was established by a disk drive company called Shugart. And the Shugart standard in 8-inch drives um, carried over to something very similar in five and a quarter inch drives and then three and a half inch drives. It's all something that you're very familiar with and it's totally different than what we have here with the Altair disc. So let's go ahead and take a look and see how this Altair disc was set up. In order to better understand the cabling between the computer and the floppy drives in the Altair, I thought I'd take a look at first at some more conventional cabling that you're probably accustomed to. For example, here we have the controller board that would be inside the computer, and then a ribbon cable runs from that controller over to your drives, or drive cabinet in this case, and that same cable runs from drive to drive. Here we see it connecting to the first drive and then looping on and connecting to the second drive. You could put more connectors on that same ribbon cable and go to more drives, up to four typically, uh, with the most common interface that we're looking at right here. So your drive cabinet is typically nothing more than a spot to put the drives and mount them and then a power supply in the back for the drives. Uh, the drives we're looking at here are Shugart 800s. These became a real industry standard and this interface that we're looking at here is typically called the Shugart interface. Here in the 8 inch days it was the 50 pin ribbon cable. Uh, Shugart created the 5 and a quarter inch mini disc drive and of course the 34 pin standard is basically the same concept as used here in the 50. And that carried on into the PC, um, all the way into the three and a half inch floppies. We're still using that same basic design. In early 1975, when MITS began designing this disk system, there weren't that many drive manufacturers to choose from. So as you might expect, MITS went with whoever made the least expensive drive. And that was this FD400 drive you see here made by a company called Pertech. Well, one of the cost saving techniques that Pertec used on this drive was to use a bent sheet metal frame as you see here, as opposed to the cast aluminum frame we saw over on the Shugart drive. The downside on this drive is that since it's more flexible, it's much more easily nudged out of alignment, especially when it's in a larger cabinet like this, where you pick up this cabinet from its corners, it can then torque the drive enough to nudge it out of alignment. Another interesting thing about this drive is that it used a direct drive DC hub motor. It was an induction motor. And um, that actually has some advantages in that you don't have to worry about the AC line voltage or the AC line frequency when you're designing your drive or having to put in different drives depending on the country. However, this particular design was plagued with a problem in that that motor would stall. And at that point, it would actually burn out some components on the control board if it was left in that condition long enough. And we'll touch on that more in just a bit. All right, now looking at the wiring, we can see that this is totally different than the ribbon cable scenario we saw over with the Shugart standard. So let's take a look at how this was done. Over here in the back, we have two connectors. One is for data coming in from the host or the previous drive. The other is for data going out to the next drive in the train chain. So the incoming data comes in on this ribbon cable. This board, MITS made this board. It's not from the drive manufacturer. 
They called this their buffer board. It would actively repeat all the signals using TTL and then send them back out this cable to the next drive in the chain. So instead of just being a passive ribbon cable with connectors per drive, they had this board in each drive that actively regenerated the signals each time. And you can see we haven't even hooked to the drive as part of that. That instead is a separate cable here that hooks directly into this drive. And that's because the drive itself didn't handle multiplexing. It could only talk to one piece of electronics at a time. So this external electronics had to do the multiplexing of multiple drives. So in the end, they may have saved money on this disk drive, but the fact they had to put this buffer board in every one of them with components and additional cabling uh, obviously was a cost factor that increased the cost probably over the cost of using the Shugart drive to begin with. Now, as the cable exits the drive, it goes back to the computer to their disk controller. The disk controller is actually these two boards. This is a hard sector controller, like most of the controllers were in the very early days of the computers. Um, this could easily have been done on one board as opposed to two. Other people did it. For example, Micropolis did it and Polymorphic did it. Northstar did it. So you could easily have made this into a single board. So again, trying to save money, um, they missed the mark in a few places and that this obviously cost them twice as much for this controller set as it really had to. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Pertec drive mechanisms that were used with Altair computer products. Over on the left is the FD400 that was in the original Altair floppy drive cabinet. This was before Pertec bought them out. Um, in the middle is the FD500 series. This is what Pertec put inside the 3202 dual drive cabinet. That's the one when Pertec now owned MITS and wanted to improve reliability of the product. And then over on the right is the FD410. This is technically a replacement for the FD400 over on the left, um, but it didn't begin shipping until after Pertec had completely canceled the Altair product line. So it was never shipped in an original floppy cabinet for the Altair. However, it was used to repair the Altair cabinets for several years um, because it was a drop-in replacement for the FD400 on the left. All right, so all three of these mechanisms look very, very similar. Um, in fact, the, the basic body of all of them is the same. Now, what Pertec did to try to save money was use sheet metal to make these as opposed to a cast frame. If you look back here at the Shugart uh, SA800, which was really the, the workhorse of the industry, it's a big cast aluminum frame. So extremely rigid, which is what helps keep everything in alignment. Uh, Pertec tried to do it in a more cheap manner using sheet metal, very sh thick sheet metal, but um, these still came out of alignment pretty easy. And if you'll notice here on the FD400, uh, there is no crossbar. Here you can see they added a crossbar on these later models to help improve rigidity. And in fact, one of their things when they mentioned putting this inside the Altair cabinet is to only attach it in three points on the bottom instead of four. So that as you pick up the drive cabinet and move it, it doesn't actually flex the drive mechanism itself. All right, so if you look inside these, again, they're all the same. Back there where you see the motor on that 500 series, you can see that's just an empty hole on the 400. Um, that's because this 400 has a DC direct drive motor. We'll turn these over and look at that in a minute. And again, the 500 has the AC motor over on the left. And then this 410 was unique. It was still a DC motor. So it still had the, um, the features of a DC drive, but they went to a belt drive to help improve reliability. We'll take a look at that as well. Let's go ahead and flip these over and take a look at the underside. All right, I've turned all three of these drives over and I removed the circuit board that controls everything so that we can see the drive mechanisms inside these. Over here on the FD400, you can see the direct drive motor there. This is an induction motor and the three phases for the winding are generated by the circuit board. And even though they did that by the book, this motor tended to stall frequently, as we mentioned, and that would cause failures in the unit. Um, but a DC drive does have its advantages, as we mentioned before, in that it's universal in terms of the power supply and the line frequency. However, Pertec primarily moved to this AC drive, the 500 series. There you can see an AC motor. It's going to be synchronous with a 60 hertz or 50 hertz line. And then, of course, the pulleys would have to be adjusted for 50 hertz or 60 hertz to make up for the, um, the difference in frequency. And then also, of course, it had to handle either 240 volts or 120 volts as well. Um, but there are advantages to having a DC drive, and so that's why they came out with this FD410. But you can see it's a DC drive, but it's still driven by a belt. And in the back, we have a 24-volt DC motor, 
and you can see the slotted wheel there with an index sensor, a, a photo sensor back there, so that it can track the speed of that motor. And this just uses pulse width modulation to control the voltage to a standard motor. So much simpler, and they got away from trying to drive an induction motor themselves. And this offered the advantage of the DC drive that the FD400 had. I've reinstalled the control boards on these uh, drives now. One thing I wanted to point out that's kind of interesting, if you look at these two drives on the right, one is the DC drive with the 24 volt DC motor on the right, and the one on the left is the 500 with the AC series. These two control boards are actually the exact same circuit board, just stuffed slightly different. If you look over on the board on the right, it's got a lot more parts stuffed down here than over here. Uh, those are the parts for the motor speed control of the DC motor. But you can tell that this drive on the left must have been a later drive since it's using the same circuit board as this newer FD410 that has the motor speed on it. But um, anyway, that was just a, an interesting observation. And this is an older board for driving that three-phase motor. You can see these giant resistors are part of that drive, and these transistors were the ones that would tend to fail when that motor would stall. I've provided a variety of fairly disjoint information about the Altair disk and the Pertec drive mechanisms in this video. To help wrap it up and make a little bit more sense of it, I would really recommend watching the videos that I've posted links to underneath this video. There they'll talk about some of the other things Pertec did once they acquired MITS and other drive mechanisms they put together using these Pertec drives. For example, uh, the 3202 cabinet, which basically was dual drives, like the one we were just looking at, except now in one cabinet. And then the FD3712, uh, which is another dual drive cabinet. These replaced having to use two of these Altair disc cabinets and uh, really improved the reliability of them and made them way more manufacturable. And some of that's addressed in those videos. So be sure to watch those and go ahead and that will do a good job of helping to wrap up this video.